in the far future. In a world left behind by humans, androids and machines fight for the future of the world. Three humanoid androids fight and die again and again, discover what it means to be human, and buy machine bits from a car with a scary face. Hi, I'm Seth with The Leaderboard, and we're here to check out the sequel that nobody saw coming. Brace yourself for weirdness and get your fight unit ready to rumble, because we've got 107 facts about Nier Automata. For the glory of humanity, let's get started. <laughs> Nier Automata is an open-world character action RPG released in North America on March 7, 2017. It saw a release two weeks earlier in Japan on February 23rd, and shortly after the US received it, it was released for the rest of the world on March 10th. The game was published by Square Enix, but developed by Platinum Games, a studio known for fast-paced high-action games like Bayonetta and The Wonderful 101. Before we get too deep into the game itself, let's meet some of the people behind it. Nier Automata is a game that bears the mark of its creators much more openly than most AAA games, and no creator has left a bigger mark on it than the director Yoko Taro. An industry veteran, Yoko Yoko Taro has been directing games since 2003's Dragon Guard, or Dragon Dragoon if you're playing in Japanese, on the PlayStation 2. He started his career at a game studio named Kavia, which was a team on the Enix side of the pre-Square Enix merger. While working on Nier Automata, Yoko Taro had to move to the studio for Platinum Games in Osaka, Japan, a pretty substantial move away from his family in Tokyo. Some of the team commented on how Yoko Taro essentially lived in the Platinum offices. While he likes to say he just loafed around the office and drank beer, the team commented on how Yoko Taro had a constant involvement in Nier Automata and was extremely dedicated to the project. Yoko Taro likes to make games that are constantly changing form to provide unexpected experiences, as he often finds the excitement of a new game wearing off after 20 minutes or so. He hopes to keep the game fresh while keeping the player guessing, a mindset he took into the first Nier game and every game since. Speaking of which, did you notice something odd about Yoko Taro? He's known for hating to appear in interviews and always appears wearing masks or hiding what he looks like in one way or another, even using puppets in some interviews. It's been said that he even hides his face from his friends at times. The mask he wears in much of the promo materials for Nier Automata is the mask of Emil, a character who appeared in the original Nier. Emil was teased to also appear in Nier Automata, raising questions about the connections between the two games. Yoko Taro was joined at the top by producer Yosuke Saito, another industry veteran who's worked as a producer on many of the same projects. He's responsible for getting the project running, despite the lukewarm reception of previous games in the series. In fact, he and Yoko Taro set up an ultimatum for the production of their new game, saying that it only had six months to impress them or it would be scrapped. But the passion of the developers pulled the project along and it was able to finish its development cycle. The development cycle was carried out at Platinum Games under the direction of game designer Taro Takahisa. Taro designed the combat system for the game, citing that he wanted it to play into the story because it was such an important element to fans of the first game. Oh hey, and just in case you frame rate junkies are listening, Platinum Games has confirmed that Nier Automata will run at 60 frames per second, even with all those insane particle effects flying around on each of the million bullets being fired at you at once. This game marked the first time that Platinum Games worked together with Square Enix on a project. While the team had assistance from other parties like Square Enix and Side Designation, a majority of the development was done at Platinum. The collaboration between the two development studios feels like it was fated to happen. Members of the Platinum Games team had been big fans of the previous Nier game, and always wanted to work on something in the franchise. Meanwhile, Square Enix had always wanted to collaborate with Platinum Games on a project, and was just looking for the right fit. Little did either of them know that both of their dreams would come true. Nier Automata's character design was carried out by Akihiko Yoshida, a character artist who started his career in 1995 with Square, and then continued when the company became Square Enix, before leaving to go freelance in 2013. Hot off his work in the Bravely Default series, he was approached by the team to do character design, but producer Yosuke Saito thought there was no way someone of such a high caliber would be interested in the project. Luckily for the team, the CEO of Side Designation the company Akihiko worked for was a huge Nier fan. A deal was struck and Akihiko was on board. So how did we get to Nier? Well, let's start with Yoko Taro's first game, Drakengard. Drakengard is the spiritual predecessor to Nier in gameplay mechanics and is even connected to its story in a strange, complex way. Let's step back in time, shall we? So Drakengard. It was developed by Kavia, a studio who had just hired Yoko Taro. While originally hired to be the game's art director, he took the position of director when the previous director left to work on other projects. Drakengard was known back in its day for its fusion of different gameplay genres. It primarily switched between an early action RPG style while on the ground, and a flight combat game all a Star Fox or Ace Combat while on the back of your dragon. The plot follows a prince named Kaim who's made a pact with a dragon named Angelus. A prince from a union on the losing side of the war, he struggles to turn the tide against the Empire in a mysterious group called the Cult of the Watchers, who are hell-bent on destroying the world. The game's plotline is dark and mysterious, traits that would become hallmarks of Yoko Taro's games in the future. He said in an interview with Forbes that Square Enix was not particularly interested in the story, so I did whatever I felt like doing. I have fond memories of getting many complaints about this after the fact. Drakengard had five endings you could receive based on how you played the game. This multiple ending setup would also become a staple of all of Yoko Taro's games in the future. The game's fifth ending involved the main character and the final boss taking their fight to a modern day Tokyo. The fallout of this battle littered the air with a magical dust and left the state of Tokyo unclear. This ending was a setup for 2010's Nier, a spin-off that took place in the year 3351. The mysterious remnants of Drakengard's final boss are plaguing the world with a magical disease, which sends a man named Nier off on a quest to find a cure. The first Nier game had two different versions, Nier Replicant on the PlayStation 3 and Nier Gestalt on the Xbox
Xbox 360. That being said, the only differences between the two versions are the identities of Nier and the victim of this disease he's trying to cure. Specifically, Nier Replicant has a young, boyish protagonist who needed to save his younger sister, while Nier Gestalt has an older, gruffer protagonist who wants to save his daughter. This was an attempt to make Nier appeal to a broader market in the East and the West. In fact, this protagonist split was so region-driven that when the game made its way to the West, only Nier Gestalt was released, with its older protagonist. The localization also dropped the subtitle, releasing simply as Nier. Nier also expanded the gameplay combination further by incorporating elements of bullet hell games into the mix, weaving them into the ground combat. The game also used creative camera settings to incorporate platforming mechanics, stick shooter elements, and more. While reviews for Nier were middling, the game became a cult hit that attracted more and more fans as time went on, with even some of the more critical reviews of Nier admitting that there was something special hidden there. Nier Gestalt and Replicant were the final games developed by Studio Caviar. Despite this, Yoko Taro moved on to work under Square Enix to direct future games such as Drakengard 3, which released in 2013. During Square Enix's 2015 E3 press conference, they announced Nier Automata to the world in a trailer showing off concept art of the game's settings, and revealed a quick look at the new game's main character, 2B. The fan response to the reveal was bigger than anyone expected. The internet was flooded with reaction videos of big fans going wild at the sight of the new reveal, and Yoko Taro even made a video to thank Nier fans for their enthusiasm. If you thought the original Nier was set pretty far into the future, then Automata is gonna blow you away. Automata's story takes place in the far-off year of 11945, almost 10,000 years in the future. The Earth in Nier Automata was invaded by, get this, machine servants built by aliens thousands of years before the game begins. That's right, after dragons, gods, and magic, we've now got aliens and their robots to contend with. The alien machine attack caused what was left of humanity to flee to the safety of the moon, despite trying to brainstorm ways to retake Earth. This leads humanity to the foundation of Yorha, a group of androids who are sent down to Earth to fight the machines occupying it to reclaim it for humanity. The game opens during what it calls the 14th Machine War, with players assuming control of battle android 2B, who was sent on a mission to attack a machine factory on the surface of Earth. On the mission, 2B meets a data collection android named 9S, the game's secondary main character. Together, they team up to make their way through the ruined machine factory, and the game is on its way. During this opening sequence alone, Nier Automata ramps up with wild gameplay shifts. You thought you were playing a character action game, but instead the game opens with Gradius-style space shooting that swaps back and forth to a twin-stick shooter, all before even touching the ground. After clearing the introductory mission, the game shifts to an open-world environment with seamless connections between areas, combat encounters, and story moments. The game opens from here on out, allowing players to explore and tackle the game as they will. As is to be expected of an open-world game, there are plenty of hidden goodies to find. Players can find new weapons, robot pod assistants, secret documents, upgrade chips, special side quests, and bits and bobs to craft stronger weapons. On the topic of weapons, Nier Automata has 40 weapons to be obtained throughout the game. These weapons are divided into four different categories. Small swords, large swords, spears, and fist weapons called combat bracers. In true Platinum game style, each of the weapon types has a full moveset, letting players craft flashy, intricate combos they can use to destroy the machine menace. Every weapon you find can be upgraded using materials that drop from defeated machines. These upgrades do things you expect, like upping damage, increasing combo length, unlocking abilities, etc. Interestingly enough, though, each weapon also has a story associated with it. These stories are often abstract, vaguely connected little tales that are told in chunks as you upgrade the weapon. Be warned, though, they're all bombers. Each character has distinct movesets that set them apart, and their own set of special abilities that change up the gameplay. 2B, the game's first playable character, fights with two weapons at the same time. One weapon is mapped to your light attacks, and the other to your heavy attacks. Each weapon allows a different number of hits in the combo, and 2B can swap them back and forth to create new attack options. She can even, if you get desperate enough, self-destruct as a last-ditch effort to overcome the enemy. The second playable character, 9S, can only fight with one weapon at a time, mapped to the light attack button. Not only that, but his moveset is slower, and his attacks have a less impressive range and flair compared to his combat modeled partner. However, the data collection android has a special trick up his sleeve, a hacking ability mapped to the heavy attack button. Should you successfully initiate a hack with 9S, don't think it's over. Hacking machine lets you take it inside its mechanical brain, represented as an asteroid-style top-down shooter. 9S will have to fight against the machine's mental defenses to take it over. Should you be successful, he can make the machine self-destruct, attack other enemies, or even assume direct control over it. The third playable character is the mysterious A2, the rogue android who fights for herself alone. Like 2B, she can also fight with two weapons at the same time. To change things up, A2's dodge mechanic is a teleport instead of a dash, letting her phase through attacks and enemies to attack from new angles. She also ditches the self-destruct that 2B and 9S can use, replacing it with a berserker mode that increases her damage and speed, but at the cost of gradually draining her health bar. However, there are a few things that all the characters can do. No matter what character you're playing as, you'll always have access to a pod unit. This is a little rectangular robot you've probably noticed flying around your character. Your pod accompanies you throughout the journey, and it's a very useful tool. The pod serves as your ranged attack option, which allows you to fire projectiles toward whatever you're locked onto, or directly towards wherever the center of the camera is pointed. The pod's attacks are defaultly mapped to the R1 button, enabling players to shoot at enemies while doing combo stunts. If you've got nerves of steel, you can even shoot at enemies while you slash completely different ones. Pod also serves as a vital defensive tool, as its attacks can destroy certain enemy projectiles. Enemies can fire dark red and bright red projectiles, each of which is almost as big as the androids you're playing as, to make 
make things more hectic, they often fire tons of them at the same time, daring you to try and dodge them all. Your pod can destroy bright red projectiles with its own, allowing players to punch holes in an enemy range attacks and carve a path in to get close. Players can find multiple pods with different abilities, such as gatling bullets or homing attacks. In addition, there are also pod programs that you can customize each pod with. Pod programs allow the pod they're installed in to perform special attacks, like giant laser beams or gravity wells to draw enemies to a point. Things really start to get crazy when you put different programs on each pod and then start switching between them on the fly. What's that? You want more customization? Nier has you covered. Wrapping up the entire suite of customization options is the plug-in chip system, which lets you insert different chips into your Android brain to retool your entire playstyle. Plug-in chips let you augment different aspects of your approach, giving you passive abilities like higher melee damage or quicker movement speed, and by enabling new techniques such as counterattacks or auto-healing. Each chip has a different amount of space it takes up in your limited Android brain port, but you can register up to three different chipsets to switch between styles whenever you need. You can purchase plug-in chips from certain NPCs in the world, or find them by defeating enemies. You can also combine chips with the same name to create more powerful versions of them, which can change how much space they take up and how potent their effects are. This system lets you try out all sorts of wild builds, letting you take full advantage of just how many options you're given to approach combat scenarios. This chip system also helps theme the game by homing in on the fact that the player character is an android. Some of the chips you start the game with are chips that enable aspects of your heads-up display, like showing health bars or damage values. Only two points shy of that really cool attack chip you want to install? You could always disable your mini-map for it. With all the combat options available to players, one might imagine that there are all sorts of flashy, intricate combo possibilities just waiting to be discovered. And you'd be right, it wouldn't be a Platinum Games production without them after all. The game even includes a debug mode to let you test things to your heart's desire and discover all the crazy tech you need to keep machines juggled in the air for absurdly long combos. Make sure to self-destruct cancel your launchers. If you think you're a true combo fiend who's looking for a greater challenge, the game's difficulty modes offer a lot in the way of new challenges. Unlike in most games, Nier Automata's different difficulty settings don't change the health settings of your enemies. Instead, all of the modes change the player's options and damage that they take. There are four difficulty settings. Easy, Normal, Hard, and Very Hard. Compared to the baseline Normal mode, Easy gives you access to a lot of chips that will automatically do certain functions for you, making it for players who mostly just want to experience the story mode. Hard mode removes the lock-on feature, forcing you to have a sharp aim with your pod weapons. On Very Hard mode, you die in one hit from anything, and you still can't lock on. So what awaits you if you can overcome everything with your super wild combat antics? In line with other games in Nier's history, Nier Automata has a host of different endings. Don't freak out though, the game has five true endings, which are the only ones with actual cinematic scenes. These endings are A, B, C, D, and E. This means that, as you probably guessed, the other 21 endings are named after the remaining letters in the alphabet, all the way down to ending Z. Endings F through Z are jokey hidden endings that can be found by doing weird things or going directly against certain mission objectives. These endings are simply marked with a black screen and a line or two of text, followed by credits flying by in just a second or two. A lot of these endings can happen without warning, so make sure you've saved recently. Here's a few of the silly things you can do to get some of these joke endings. Self-destruct on the moon base. Eat a mackerel. Abandon characters who call for help. Flee from boss fights. Die during the intro. Stuff like that. These endings have their own titles, too, all of which include the letter that corresponds to the ending. Have you gotten to the time to relax ending? Or the city escape ending? Earning all those endings won't be easy, and it's to be expected that you'll fall more than once at the hands of the machines. But don't fret, you're an android. Nier Automata has a corpse run mechanic, which is to say that the remains of your past attempts will stay where they fell, along with all the chips that you had equipped. So if you're able to make it back to your body, you can reclaim your chips and even get a little experience for your trouble. But wait, there's more. Upon finding your body, you can also choose to either retrieve or repair it, both of which can help you progress through the game. Retrieving a body sends its essences back to the Yorha base in orbit, awarding you with resources like chips, experience, and money. Repairing the body reactivates it, letting a useful sort of weird skeletal android fight alongside you for a little while. Repairing your past bodies is a bit of a strange experience, too. Not only is it weirdly skeletal with visible moving plates and joints, but the repaired bodies actually explode in agony after a set amount of time. What? And this awards experience? Sometimes the repair even fails, and the body you wanted to help you could instead attack you as a bizarre android zombie. While Nier Automata isn't a multiplayer game, connecting to the network still has an effect. The bodies of other players can even appear in your game, giving you more sources of expendable help and bonus money and chips. Seeing four or five bodies in the same room is also a pretty good warning that the room ahead is a dangerous one, which always helps. As if you needed even more strange, customizable things to play with, upon death you can leave a little message by filling in three blanks with options pulled from a giant list. These let you give others who find your body some insight into your death with messages like, a wild machine fell in combat deep underground. Or you can write something like, I died in a pit, as a joke. Because why not? If you want to talk about true game death, though, get a load of this. So after obtaining ending E, the most difficult to obtain full ending, the game gives you an interesting question. The game congratulates you on making it this far, commenting on how hard you must have fought before asking you if you'd like to help another player who may need it in exchange for all of your save data. They're not kidding around either, they'll actually delete all your save data if you agree. So what is your save data worth? Well, without going into spoilers, you have to clear an extremely tough shooting segment during the game's credits after seeing endings A, B, C, and D. Aside 
essentially it's sort of like a final challenge for players who really want to see everything. If you're having trouble though, the ships of other players can appear alongside you to give you more firepower or greater health during the segment. Treat those ships with care since each one costs someone their entire near Automata save file. On the topic of um, death, while the game was being promoted, a commercial was released in Japan that shows dismembered pieces of dolls on a conveyor belt while 2B narrates that we were born to be destroyed, even though we're inanimate, we kill each other. Seems pretty dark, right? Well, this commercial is actually a censored version. The original commercial featured dolls being actively destroyed by saws, drills, and all sorts of nasty machinery. To finish the ad, we get a quick shot of an android stabbing 2B with a sword. What? I won't be able to sleep tonight. And on the topic of commercials, to swing the tonal pendulum to the complete other side, there was an ad featuring Yoko Taro alongside Platinum Games developer Taro Takahisa to announce a pre-order bonus t-shirt for the game. Instead of just telling us about the shirt, because that's too boring, Yoko Taro rips the said shirt off of Tara and then rolls around on the ground with the shirt in hand, repeating, Nier Automata t-shirt, Nier Automata t-shirt, Nier Automata t-shirt. Yeah, he definitely grabbed our attention. If it wasn't quite apparent to you, I'm gonna spell it out. Nier Automata's a really weird game full of weird things. One moment you're discovering a machine has taught itself what it means to feel emotions, and the next you're purchasing PSN trophies with robot parts. It's true, there's a secret shop where you can spend in-game currency on unlocking trophies. Unlocking a platinum trophy just got a whole lot easier. The development team has said multiple times that though the game shares the near name and takes place in the same world, the stories are leagues apart and largely unconnected. Largely doesn't mean entirely though, and there are a few more connections between Nier and Nier Automata. One of the most obvious ones for those who played through the original Nier are the red-headed android twins Devola and Popola, who return in Nier Automata as outdated android models that support 2B and 9S with rare items. Another character from the first Nier also returns in a new form. Young boy turned experimental super weapon Emil is back, sporting his distinctly toothy face which Yoko Taro seems so fond of. This time, he leaves the high action combat mechanics behind to become a traveling merchant. While these connections appear to be where they end, eagle-eyed players might catch another mysterious callback to the series' origins. The human-looking machine Eve is seen in a few trailers transforming while preparing to battle with 2B and 9S, but there's something mysterious happening as he does. His skin crawls with what looks like ink, appearing in geometric shapes that seem like nothing more than cool patterns, but if you look closely though, you can catch a glimpse of the symbol of the Cult of the Watchers, an evil organization from the very first game in the series, Drakengard. There are a number of other aspects that seem like coincidental connections between the titles, such as aggressive enemies having glowing red eyes, or otherwise unimportant items appearing in both titles. None of these connections are outright stated as such either, leaving us to wonder why. Well, why there are even mysteries that don't have anything to do with anything. Throughout the game world, for example, are four different robots that beg for forgiveness in front of locked doors, warning you that you cannot go inside, and even self-destruct as an apology for keeping those doors closed. Nobody knows what the purpose of these doors are. Nier Automata even has a few secret bosses. Some of them hedge into spoiler territory, so we won't cover those here, but one of them is an exception. When you arrive in the amusement park area, your first sight is a party of machines dancing around a giant statue of a machine with rabbit ears. If you attack this statue for long enough, it awakens to attack you. Be super careful though, this thing hits like a truck and has a load of health, so be sure you're prepared before taking it on. Nier Automata asks some hard questions of the player and delves deep into some really tough psychological questions. Central among its theme is the constant question of what it means to be human. Throughout the game, 2B and 9S are constantly reminded that the machines are intended to be, well, machines. Machines are the enemy. Machines cannot think. Machines do not understand the meaning behind the words they say. Machines are just imitating behavior without understanding it. The game bombards you with these reminders which contrast what you're actually seeing, making you constantly question any new information. The game even tries to put you in this black and white mindset of androids versus machines by making areas of the game literally black and white. The Yorha space base is always shown in shades of gray, while the world below is lush and full of color. In addition, there are no humans in the primary narrative of the game at all. Every time 2B or 9S complete a mission or gather essential data on the machines, the commander simply transmits it to the human base on the moon and you're never allowed to see them or even hear their voices. Remember, all the characters you play as are androids. Not only that, but all the androids are actually aware of the fact they're androids. They frequently reference traits of being androids, such as uploading memories to a server or switching to temporary bodies and making personality backups, and discuss them casually. Nier goes all in on making sure the player doesn't forget that they're playing as an inhuman android, no matter how close they look to a human. Despite everything the androids and by extension the player are told, the machines on Earth exhibit strangely human-like behaviors. Bosses include machines that have become obsessed with human concepts like beauty or hate, and a forest hides a village of machines who claim to detest violence and live peaceful lives. Some machines even assign themselves gender and familial roles, despite all claims that they should be incapable of doing so. As if that weren't bad enough, Yoko Taro even had the machine units designed to look cute so the players would feel bad for killing them. Talk about a crisis of conscience. Whew, we went pretty deep there. Let's pull back for a moment and take a look at Nier Automata's soundtrack. The soundtrack was composed by Keiichi Okabe, who worked alongside the team at Caveat to compose the soundtrack to the original Nier as well. The soundtracks for both Nier and Nier Automata received high praise, some reviews even touting it as the best aspects of either title. It's said that Keiichi is a longtime friend of Yoko Taro, and the two worked together to really nail down the tone of the soundtrack. When recording the soundtrack, 
soundtrack, you can hear Okabe sing some of the lines. A lot of the tracks that have vocals are pulled from various voice talents on the team, as well as children's choirs found to participate in the game. They had to go hunting for those choirs, though, because the group they used previously had gotten too old to hit the notes they were looking for. A prominent vocalist on the soundtrack was a singer named Emmy Evans, who previously worked on Nier. She wrote lyrics for the first game and even developed the strange language they sing in. She developed them as a combination of English, French, Gaelic, Japanese, and tried to imagine what they would all sound like after 1,000 years of change. The soundtrack was released as a three-disc set on March 29th, 2017. Early copies of the soundtrack even included a mysterious fourth disc. And let me know if you crack its secrets. Nier Automata has dual voice track, letting players hear the voice work in both English and Japanese. In addition, both the English and Japanese voice actors for Emil and the twins Devola and Popola reprise their roles from the original Nier. While some of the songs are sung in the language created for the music by Amy Evans, there are a few tracks that are sung by some of the machine life forms or other characters that appear. Said songs are sung in the language of the voice track, so make sure to listen closely if you want to check out each of the different audio tracks. On December 22nd, 2016, Square Enix put out the first demo of Nier Automata. The demo covered the ground combat section of the game's first mission and was the first time the public got their hands on the game. The demo worked in Nier's trademark camera switches and gameplay change em ups to wow players, ending with a boss battle against a colossal machine and a plot stinger to get everyone riled up for the full release. The demo itself was met with overwhelmingly positive press, with all of gaming's biggest sites reporting on the action, and with everyone sufficiently pumped for the upcoming release in the next two months. Something strange came out of the demo, however. Not the strange you'd expect from a game like Nier. You see, when players found out you could destroy 2B's skirt with the self-destruct feature, things got a little out of hand. Photoshops and all sorts of edited screenshots of 2B's behind flooded social media for a quick minute, appearing so quickly and in such quantity that it became tough to keep track of what was actually real. The flood of confusion even prompted a response from Yoko Taro himself. What did he have to say? He tweeted, because of all the brouhaha over 2B's butt, there are lots of rude drawings and whatnot being uploaded online, and since going around collecting them is a pain, I'd like it if I could get them sent in a zip file every week. That's one way to clear things up, I guess. And of course, Yoko Taro was given all sorts of zip files from Twitter. He thanked his fans for their, let's call it, diligent work, remarking that this brand of weird dedication is part of what makes the internet great. So after all the passion and hard work put into Nier Automata, how did it fare? As of this video, Nier Automata is sitting at an 88 on Metacritic, making it the highest rated game that Yoko Taro has ever been a part of. Critics and players alike raved about the in-depth combat system, the heartbreaking plotline, the wonderful soundtrack, and the game's unique flavor of silliness. To provide some context, Drakengard sits at a 63%, and the original Nier sits at 68%. During their times, Drakengard only managed to sell about 650,000 copies, while Mir managed only around 800,000. Nier Automata, however, just over one month after its release, has broken over 1 million sales, making it the highest selling game by the same team. Pretty good for a sequel to a nearly unheard of game, huh? Yoko Taro himself was moved by the numbers, even tweeting out to his English fans to show his gratitude. So what's next for the mass developer? When asked, he replied, I'm thinking of returning to being unemployed. I get bored very fast, so I'd like to do something new. Something like a restaurant is attractive. It does seem to be a very tough job, though. Well, we definitely think you've earned a rest. Once again, I'm Seth, and thanks for watching 107 Facts about Nier Automata. Have you played it yet? Which character do you like to play as? Did we miss any secrets? Comment below and let us know. Don't forget to click the bell icon to become part of the notification squad. And if you like getting more from your games, make sure to subscribe to the leaderboard, where we help you game smarter.